Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming um, to our evening of poetry. Our, our special featured poet uh, today is Judith Saunders. She is a professor uh, over at Merrick's College, professor of English, and she is a published poet and author of nonfiction. Uh, she has been published in several regional and national publications, including Chronogram, Blue Line, Chiron Review, Poet Lore, South Carolina Review, and the Christian Science Monitor. Um, and she is the author of two prize-winning chapbooks of poetry. So welcome, Judith. Uh, we're so happy to have you. Thanks for joining. Well, you all deserve a lot of credit for supporting the arts on such a gloomy, gloomy night. Uh, a lot of the journals where uh, I publish have been putting out calls. They would like writers to send things, their thoughts about the pandemic and what we've all been going through and so on. And I thought I would maybe turn to drama and do um, a woman cuts her own hair, a tragedy in three acts. <laughs> We're all so dependent on these things we can't get anymore. I, think, I thought I would start with some poems about plant life because the most recent poem I finished uh, happened to be about our amaryllis. Uh, a few years ago, somebody gave me one of those $7 boxes of an amaryllis bulb from Kohl's or someplace like that, and, and it duly bloomed at Christmas time, and it was very beautiful. And then there are always directions on the box about how you can make it bloom again, but I didn't really sort of believe that too much. But this thing has just been like the Gen Energizer bunny. Stick it in the garage. After a few months, you notice it's got little shoots. Stick it in the pot, and boom, more amaryllis. So. Uh, that seemed like kind of a cheering thought in these times, so that led to this poem called The Amaryllis Flowers Again. How much life force is stored, and for how long in this gnarled bulb? How many starry blooms will shoot to urgent heights from root-packed pots, scarlet whirligigs replenishing our room with imperturbable twirling? And once I had read, written that, it made me uh, remember that I had written a poem about Woodbine, the, sort of a companion piece of sorts. When I first moved to this part of the country, I was so charmed in the fall with the red vines, you know, going around the trees. And then gradually I read about them and discovered they were this very dangerous, invasive vine that is choking the tree. And that indeed, if you let it really get a hold, it gets thicker and thicker. It gets really thick like wood, you know, and I, it actually kills trees, brings them down. So I thought that was kind of a nice horticultural metaphor. Uh, so here's Woodbine. A romance bound to end in slow but sure disaster. These fond, encircling tendrils tighten their crimson clasp relentlessly with hardening intent, a wooden chokehold. There will be time to regret this brilliant embrace, this tenacious desire, but not yet. And then that made me think of the tulips I planted last November. Um, really optimistically, because all the neighbors say that, uh, yeah, come in, come in, there's lots of room. Uh, the neighbors say that the deer and the squirrels will get the bulbs and so on. But I noticed I got two inches of one of them up, and it hasn't been eaten yet. So maybe I will get my tulips. And what I wanted was black tulips, which I really admire, the ones that are called Queen of the Night. So here's Queen of the Night. Beside your dark-cloaked elegance, the prettiness of other tulips palls. Their bourgeois yellows, pinks and reds, all show and shine, mere paint. They broadcast daytime cheer. Meanwhile, you sift sheer blackness. Murmuring of deep maroons and dusky purples, you conjure opalescent nights, promise news of distant inky galaxies. Slow burning, your fires are banked, your beauty, its mysterious authority, unquenched. Another thing I uh, started seeing uh, when I moved to this part of the country was escaped flowers. I had heard of escaped fruit when you see apple trees and cherry trees growing in the middle of the woods. But escaped always sounds like they're animals that clawed their way out of a cage and so on. Um, 
when really you're talking about how birds and squirrels and other animals might have eaten them and deposited the seeds, probably by excreting them, out in the middle of the wilderness. So you come upon these fruit trees or whatever, and they're called escaped. But daffodils escape a lot, and apparently they're one of the best flowers to grow around here because deer don't eat them. Uh, so I saw a patch that appealed to me, and I wrote this poem about them. The progress of their exodus is plain, adventurous blossoms trailing crookedly across the yard away from ordered rows of floral display, straggling haphazardly past the fence, jumping the road, circumventing a mailbox, landing in a ditch. There they've settled, and aisled in scruffy tangles of wild sorrel, plantain, mugwort, and pigweed, their bright-crowned heads nodding a, be a breezy farewell to cultivated comforts. Entered now for good in aboriginal free-for-all, they hold their own. They dare to thrive, indulge their yen for liberty, and improvise a garden. And the last plant poem I wanted to read is about uh, some morning glories. It was, I don't know how many years ago now, but we just kept having summer. It just didn't seem to get cool and turn into autumn. And I kept passing a neighbor's house where the morning glories were still bravely going. And each day you'd think, well, this is the end. They'll be gone tomorrow. And still, they'd be there another day. And it was very inspiring to me. So I called this late first frost. Undaunted by the threat of autumn, these morning glories keep trumpeting their glad blue news. Some things last longer than you'd hoped. Prodigal, they fill the cool October air with summer themes more elegant, more vivid than July's, lingering another day and then another beyond the boundaries of expectation or desert, composedly accepting more than there was their due blooming unastonished and resplendent. So, after the horticultural stuff, I thought I would move on to some poems about art. I think I saw on the calendar here that uh, one of my colleagues from Marist gave a program here maybe as recently as last Sunday about poems about art. Don't know if you saw that. I have yeah, so she was, I think it was actually kind of a workshop, kind of encouraging people, uh, suggesting ways that you could use visual art, or for that matter, any kind of art, but usually it's visual, uh, to stimulate poetry. And usually it involves a kind of translating process. You're going to try to maybe recreate a painting or a photograph or a sculpture in words. But it isn't just describing it, you're trying to evoke it, and inevitably you're giving a kind of twist that's interpretive to it, you know, what that work of art is sort of saying to you. And your reaction might be uh, deliberately very different from perhaps the typical reaction of that particular work of art. Uh, it might consciously take up a debate with the work of art, for that matter. And you can do it with anything. You can do well-known works. You could write, these are called ekphrastic poems, but you could write one about the Mona Lisa that everybody knows, or you could write it about a photograph your Uncle Amber to, Ambrose uh, took last Easter. Um, as long as you, you create language that will enable the reader to see something of what you saw and hear what you have to say about it. So this poem was about um, a picture by Mondrian. He's the guy who does the ge geometrical stuff with the boxes and the lines. And he has a whole series called composition number one, composition number two, and so on. I forget how far it goes. But uh, I wrote this about his composition number 10. Uh, I was intrigued by it and sort of drawn to it because it seemed incomplete almost compared to some of his others. And this poem. Uh, talks about that a bit. <coughs> Exhausted by his own geometry in compositions one through nine, Mondrian left much undone in number 10. The canvas is scored with clean black lines and perpendiculars, but crucial edges are missing, boundaries undrawn, only scattered squares, small and few, inconsequential, have been filled with color. Plainly dispirited, the painter abandoned his design, walked away from this study of purposes unrealized. 
No doubt he meant to return, define a subject, delineate a theme. One day soon, perhaps, we may visit the museum to find that Mondrian, now rested and restored to his passion for precision, has roused himself to action overnight, applied himself anew to number 10, extending lines, completing frames, closing up boxes of empty space, opening big, bold windows into worlds of red or yellow or blue. And of course, you don't have to have seen that exact picture to uh, have the poem say something to you. You just have to know a little bit about what Mondrian's work looks like. Now, this is a poem that was inspired by a work I saw at Dia Beacon. I don't know how many of you have been to that uh, place that houses contemporary art. Uh, it was made, I was interested to learn, from a space that was originally a box printing factory owned by Nabisco. And it's huge, and so it's perfect for displaying uh, quite enormous works of art, not just big things sitting there in the middle of the floor, although they have plenty of those, but big things on the walls. You see just huge uh, canvases that just go up so far. I mean, they're just enormous. And this thing was called Wall Drawing Number 118, 50 Randomly Placed Points Connected by Straight Lines. Uh, so I called this irreproducible results because it struck me it was kind of like a graph that <laughs> didn't mean anything, that didn't say anything. No better space for de no better space for defiance of scale than the tall, pale walls of Dia Beacon, a renovated box printing plant. Here, Nabisco's stark-lit vacancies showcase colossal conceptions. The magnified points and lines of number 118 stretch across, across 36 square meters of floor-to-ceiling canvas, an unlabeled graph filling blankness with unexplained connections, arbitrary sequencing, progressions, say, from factory to art foundation, from peak free to postmodernism, pencilings pilfered from the book of God's blueprints. That was actually published in the Mathematical Intelligence, a journal that uh, mathematicians subscribe to. Then I sneaked in one here, which is also a pretty recent poem that is about music. It's, does anybody here play the clarinet by any chance? Good, <laughs> because you would hate. This is one of these poems where you sort of go over the top making mock of something, and it's exaggerated mockery. It's sort of like once you get started, you sort of see how far you could go. And I know I'm being unfair to the clarinet, but it was fun being unfair. It, uh, I think when I wrote it, I was slightly inspired by a poem uh, written by somebody named Jim Gustafson about Detroit, where he goes through all the bad, bad sides of Detroit, like, He'll say things like, it's the sort of place where at Christmas time lovers give each other his and hers pistols for Christmas for presents. And the last line of the poem about Detroit is, it is the outhouse at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> so that was kind of my inspiration. So clarinet. The instrument of choice for the musically obtuse, it, it is a reservoir of vacuous sound, a halfway house between blandness and absurdity, the mundane and the obnoxious. It is what happens when a duck tries to hum. Compared with its reedy relatives, what it lacks is character. There is something to be said, after all, for the crumb horn and its archaic grumbling, or the bagpipe's boggy dirge, the bassoon's muttered burr, or the oboe's plaintive cry. But there is nothing to praise in the clarinet's prosaic beep. Inept at grandeur or subtlety, oblivious to its own banality, this squeaky woodwind persists, earnest and unabashed, in its pitiless pursuit of song, translating note after note of glorious melody into adenoidal noise. So I just have to be careful who I show that to. Uh, I wrote a poem about a collage. It doesn't really, I suppose it's a postmodern collage, but that's all one needs to know about it. <clears throat> Partly it was an attempt to try out a very rigorous form. This is a triolet, which is an eight-line poem written in an iambic meter. Lines one, four, and seven are exactly the same. Lines two and eight are exactly the same. 
and it has to have a rhyme scheme of A B A A B A B. No, A B A A A B A B. So you sit that down, you put that beside you. Okay, now I'm gonna write my poem. It takes a long time. So collage, mixed media, rambunctious designs, a higgle piggle symmetry assembles and at once defines mixed media's rambunctious designs, where willful shapes and fractious lines cavort with plain geometry. Mixed media yield rambunctious designs and higgle piggle symmetry. The next uh, ekphrastic poems I want to read uh, were written in response to arts and crafts written by a friend. So this would be the opposite of writing about something that everybody knows, like an artist like Mondrian. Um, the first one was a watercolor that she had painted, and it's about someplace local, Wappinger Creek, which isn't far from here. And the poem's called Watercolor Sunset, Wappinger Creek. Watery smudges of backlit cloud trickle down the canvas to meet their own reflection. Sky and water blur in dusky, dusty pinks and golds. In the corner, lower right, a dark form strains skyward. Blue heron lifting itself from the creek, right wing extended to beat the air. Its diagonal thrust targeting the topmost center of the scene where a sun, orange circle with yellow nimbus, pauses at the tree line puddling the water with a few last drips of light. Clumps of reeds, sparsely distributed, darken in the foreground of fading day. You did not paint the highway at your back, just outside the frame, all monotonous pavement and impatient engines, devoid of elemental peace and purpose. You could have named your composition almost unironically Commute Hour at Wappinger Creek. Day on its rose-splotched journey into night, Clouds calmly streaming in unrehearsed directions. Blue heron bound for Bali High. Then these others are mixed media. Here's one called Goddesses. In this display case, surely meant for mounting insects, you arranged your collection of ancient totems, deities, amulets, all unlabeled. Faceless female figures wielding bows and arrows, lifting tridents, bearing glories of buttocks, breasts, and bellies, signing blessings, dispensing balm, hoisting aloft a moonstone sphere. Animals accompany them, a bear, a cat, a deer, familiars and companions. Surrounding all these figures, you laid down quartz and nuggets, quiet shades of amber, violet, blue, and green, deliberately placed to frame and protect, invoking natural magic of circle and stone. Centered at the bottom of the case lies a watch face, abruptly futuristic, a reminder that no gods, no creeds, no dreams of heaven have endured. Only the gritty mysteries of flesh and bone persist, the hungers of the body, the earth itself with its jewels and its curves. And another box that this artist made, she called the House of Air. Uh, so the beginning of the poem discusses her love of heights and moves into some of what would have been her motivation in my speculation for making this particular work. Exhilarated by heights, longing to be airborne, you swayed on narrow seats of mile high, mile high ski lifts leaning into views, the drop to sharp-toothed cliffs below. Fearlessly, you drove up steepest grades, loosely graveled mountain roads, skidding around the hairpin turns, gleefully skirting precipices. You rode on monster roller coasters, savoring moments when sheer force, counter-gravitational, would lift you from your seat, propel, propel you nearly into free fall. This gabled wooden box, tall and narrow, meant for housing butterflies, you dedicated to powers of air. Assorted birds and insects, enameled metal or polymer, have landed on its sky blue roof and walls. You added nesting boxes filled with wisps of straw and spotted eggs. 
Among the starlings and dragonflies, you included unspectacular aerial artists, grasshoppers, beetles, whose brief and buzzing bursts of levitation still amazed you. To the housetop, unexpectedly, you fixed a chime, a silver tube balanced horizontally, beside it a wooden striker inviting passers-by to launch a, its single note, a high, clear tone, into airy weightlessness. And then this was a piece that she made when her elder brother was diagnosed and had been living for quite a few years with Alzheimer's. So a sad piece, elder brother with Alzheimer's. To make this sad and horrible piece, you scavenged a soccer ball, gray and limp, smeared on textured paste and wound it round with tangles of yarn, neurofibrillary fuzz twisted fibers strangling thought. That gruesomely festooned, deflated brain you mounted on the base of a dismantled music box, plastering its wood panels with photographs, a lifetime of irreclaimable selves. Youthful soldier escorting home his glamorous bride, church deacon mustering a congregation, engineer designing skis and poles for handicapped young athletes, amateur historian posed with ice-cutting tool collection, Man of the mountain leading a llama up Mount Washington. Patriarch feasting at family clambate. Three generations of descendants. Retiree trekking in Kathmandu. The music box still plays. From time to time you crank the handle. Watch the photos and flaccid head revolving slowly to a tune. The way we were. Interactive art. Grotesque as the unmaking of a brother's mind. I do like to write poems about animals, so I thought I would uh, move on to some of those. This is a poem inspired by something I saw locally. I went to a grocery store and saw that there in the fish section, you could buy alligator meat. It was expensive, but I thought, hmm. And in fact, they were trying to get people to buy it. They had a big poster you know, of a gator. So this poem is called, What's for Dinner? Alligator flesh for sale this week in frozen chunks at Poughkeepsie supermarkets, $17 per pound. Semi-aquatic carnivore, neatly stored with seafood. Above the freezers, packed with wild-caught salmon, tilapia, and shrimp, a poster tempts mid-Hudson shoppers with the smiling portrait of a life-sized gator. The bumpy green mosaic of its hide, the wide-stretched, sharp-toothed maw. Tonight, the locals, file clerks, receptionists, realtors, accountants, will barbecue descendants of the dinosaurs. And wake tomorrow, complacently rapacious, cold-blooded, hankering to drift like logs in estuarial creeks, hungry to eat more high-priced primordial meat. And another poem was inspired by a student paper. Uh, I had assigned students in a college writing class to write about, uh, to do a research paper on some animal of their choice. And one student picked moles. And among the various types of moles that he wrote about, one was called the star-nosed mole, which I'd never heard of. I see you have. And he included gruesome pictures <laughs> of this thing. It, you know what a mole looks like, basically. And the star-nosed mole lives in sort of swampy, wet, watery ground. And so it apparently needs this kind of filter to filter through the, the water and the muck and the mud to find its food. So mounted, uh, covering its face is this apparatus. I, I suppose you could vaguely say it looks like a star, but that's making it sound a lot more glamorous than it is. And I looked at those photographs and I saw he had written that, you know, it lives right around here. And I thought, boy, I'm glad he warned me. If I had ever gone out my backyard and seen one of those things, I would have run shrieking. <laughs> So I uh, studied them up a bit and wrote this. Star-nosed mole. A flowery pink wheel of fleshy tentacles surrounds what passes for your mouth, obscuring your face. You conduct your semi-aquatic business, your tireless burrowing, blindly, that rubbery drain trap permanently mounted on your snout. Only interplanetary 
interplanetary transportation can explain your presence in the boggy recesses of northeastern America. Venusian vermin, offloaded by chance or by design in an alien place, doomed to send earthlings screaming in flight from the pity and terror of your visage. And another poem was written about, um, or in response to, an experience I had a, at one of the local malls, one that's now defunct, I think, what used to be the South Hills Mall down by Fishkill. Uh, I went along one evening in April, it had been some rain in the last couple of days. It was just that nice, refreshing, damp, early spring air. And I realized I felt really kind of energized and good. And it was because of something I was smelling. And I thought, what do I smell? And I thought, I'm smelling elephant poop. <laughs> and I, then I remembered <laughs> that the week before there'd been a circus there. And they'd held it, you know, in the big parking lot. So this is called Suburban Sonnet. And I did plan it as a, a very non-traditional sonnet, but it is 14 lines. Last week, the circus at the mall, deliciously improbable, disrupted shopping's inexorable rhythms, forced customers to detour past the brassy tent and stalls, past bold flags, seductive posters, past grave gray lines of elephants, incongruously parked instead of cars in the most desirable spaces. This week, the big top's gone, but rain has released from pavement cracks residue of exotic excrement, and shoppers pause to suck in air grown strangely redolent with elephant. <laughs> I, uh, I started you know, keeping some notes in Maybe I'd write the poem, maybe I wouldn't. But what really got me going, I got so excited when I realized excrement was going to rhyme with elephant. I said, yes, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead with that one. And this poem uh, is about a two-headed snake. They've been in the news quite a lot lately. There are a lot of YouTubes, and they have that reptile show every year. They used to in the, uh, in the Civic Center. Um, you can pay a lot of money for a two-headed snake, as it turns out, uh, and it's rather hard to keep them alive. I saw my first one in San Diego, where I lived for a few years. They had quite a large one, uh, just a common king snake. Uh, and the placard that was on the exhibit explained that the only reason it was alive was because it had been caught and was in captivity, that apparently incomplete twinning happens often with snakes. But of course, they they don't survive if they're out on their own. And so that's why if you want one, you have to pay a lot of money because somebody accidentally found a little one. And uh, you can watch the YouTubes. Uh, people will have to put something, uh, uh, a divider between the heads when they feed them, you know, so that they won't take the food out of each other's mouths. Mm -hmm. And they feed them one a little before the other head because if they both swallow at the same time, it might get stuck and cause a, a gridlock in their throat, you know. Um, so anyway, I had been uh, looking at some YouTubes and looking at some two-headed snakes and thinking about that one in San Diego, and I wrote this. Except for cap captive specimens, they don't survive for long, these polycephalous monsters, victims of incomplete twinning. Joined at the neck to a body they don't realize is shared, the two brains, separate and equal, never learn to cooperate. Hunting? Two sets of hungry jaws thrust and strike at will, each spoiling the other's force and aim. Danger? Choosing its own escape route, each arrests the other's flight. In this intimate antagonism, every decision is countermanded, every action stymied. A life of battling intent, futile bids for sovereignty, and foiled design. Good for nothing, this being of two minds. And then I have another uh, animal poem that's also a poem about art. Uh, years ago, when I was an undergraduate at the University of California at Berkeley, when I was walking back to my apartment, I always passed this fenced-in area where they were endlessly constructing a new building. And some art students had sort of gone out in a kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, almost like a, I don't know flash mob <laughs> of an earlier day with their pots of paint and stuff. And they just covered the, the, the fence with artwork. So it was sort of like 
high class graffiti done by students. Mm -hmm. But my favorite thing that I always looked for when I walked by that fence was there one artist had taken advantage of the topography. You picture this cement sidewalk running along and here's the fence coming up right beside the sidewalk. And there was a broken hole in the cement right in one spot, right by the fence. So here's this little hole. And somebody had splashed red paint into the hole and then taken it up the fence and made it into this lizardy sort of reptile so that it looked like out of the depths had crawled this lizard. And I thought it was the most wonderful thing when I came to study more about art, too, because it was a perfect example of reality seeking to become art, <laughs> which I thought was sort of fascinating. So I called it underground activity. An alligator climbs determinedly, absurdly, horribly from its hole in gritty university soil onto the temporary fence guarding a Berkeley construction site, slithering up a ready-made canvas already crammed with unauthorized art. Telltale trails of dark red paint staining a convenient crevice where the crudely rendered scarlet torso of an outrageous reptile, laughing open-jawed, triumphant, emerges from radical depths to leap into the frame, seizing this chance for light and air and immortality. Ah, where is it? So two more about animals. Um, these I wrote as part of a chapbook collection I did long ago. I wrote a whole sequence of poems inspired by headlines in tabloids, grocery store tabloids. Uh, things like Bigfoot Stole My Wife and uh, Man Who Eats 10 Pounds of Metal Rusts to Death and um, Woman Gives Birth to Six Pound Pearl, things like that. You know, how can you? Some of them are just so wonderful, there's nothing more to be said. You know? But anyway, I found them inspiring. And this was uh, that part of the tabloids where psychics make predictions about the future. So, top psychic peers 10 years into future. So the first prediction was a fast-spreading new breed of termites that can chew through chunks of concrete in just hours will threaten cities across the country with wholesale destruction. Terrorist termites have eaten New York and Philadelphia and are headed for Chicago with non-negotiable demands. Unlimited right of access to national parks and forests. Exclusive timber privileges in Michigan and Idaho constitutional amendments safeguarding rights of insect pests, unconditional amnesty, no prosecution for war crimes, unilateral disarmament, no stockpiling of DDT. They have taken hostages to their secret underground nests and are unfamiliar with the Geneva Convention. And in this one, I liked even better. Soviet scientists will astonish the world as they demonstrate on satellite TV that they can turn hamburger back into a cow. <laughs> they take 1,200 weight of hamburger, knead it well, adding secret ingredients to stimulate congealment, shaping the enormous mass judiciously, galvanizing it electromagnetically into bemused existence. Not a perfect job by any means. The results a trifle lumpish. Don't look too closely at this animated amalgamation, this wholly homogenized cow. Actually, I could read a couple more from this one, whether they're animals or not. Um, How about Bigfoot stole my wife? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I always liked the Bigfoot one so much. There was one where uh, Bigfoot uh, had come and trashed a vacation home and scared the life out of the six teenagers that were up there for the weekend. And they know it was Bigfoot because the vacation house was trashed. <laughs> Couldn't have been the teenager. It had to be Bigfoot as proof, you know. It was rescue, she insists, not kidnap. After the accident, he found her where she'd fallen from the trail. He saved her life. Picture him lumbering out of the underbrush, Tarzan of the Adirondacks, scowling at her under matted brows. He heaves her over a filthy shoulder, 
carts her to his cavern shelter, where he tends her cuts and bruises, fetches leaves and grasses for a bed. For food, he brings her roots and grubs, acorns, squirrels, and even fresh strangled venison. He's a good provider, this hairy hero. Picture them sitting around the cave, floor littered with beastly bits. Watch her stroke the tufted tangles sprouting from his calloused toes. Here in this stinking Ur home, they hunker down to primeval sex. Yes, folks, that's my wife, making out with the missing link. Does she tame his brutish drives, domesticate his lust? Picture feminine principle prevailing over rough, raw maleness. Picture it, if you prefer, the other way around. Ordeal or idle, it finally ended. He helped her home by leaving her near an interstate highway on-ramp, left her there after who knows what protracted brigadoonish farewell. Picture it. <laughs> toasters possessed by the devil. <laughs> We've all had those toasters, right? Bitter smoke befouls the air, sending sulfurous signals from this charmed appliance, while stinking putrid sops leak out its nether parts. The gaping maw spews sparks of strange and hissing blue, electrifies the scene with blistering portent. Within, metallic shrieks, the din of bursting bolts, interior collapse, abandonment of hope. What priest will exorcise the imp in the machine or pluck from burning rack the charred and damned remains of this tormented toast? I don't know if any of you have ever seen, you're probably all too young to have seen this. Uh, when I was very young, one set of my grandparents had one of those old-fashioned toasters where you had to toast the sides separately. You opened the side, put in the piece of bread, closed it up, turned it on, and then you opened it and carefully turned the bread around to toast the other side. Very dangerous. No wonder they wanted something better. But um, that wouldn't have been so. I think the reason my grandparents had kept it was it didn't have problems. You know? Housewife sheds her skin like a snake. Mm -hmm. See, more animals. <laughs> it was easy. She felt herself loosening at the edges, a slight flaking of the toes and fingers, and itching in the corners of the eyes. Working gently from the navel, she peeled the skin off her torso in one smooth, translucent coil, lifted the facial epidermis almost intact, a shredding mask. She pulled from her extremities long strips of scaling tissue, simple as shedding a sunburn. From the final tickling tatters she wriggled free, born again baby, soft and moist and pink and new. Now, midget trains in clothes dryer to become astronaut. Ordinary ambitions will not content such a man. He aims for the top of the galaxy. Weekends, he visits the planetarium, memorizing the Milky Way, paints constellations on his laundry room ceiling. Nights, he devises navigational charts, writes letters to NASA, top secret, outlining unimagined routes, reports his progress. He's almost ready. Each morning, he sets the dials on his ersatz spaceship, climbs through its humble portal, and spins off to the stars. Begin the orbit extra gentle and accelerate, accelerate to special cycle, moving with the machine, leaning into turns, rotating head over heels in ceaseless somersault, a controlled gyration. Pace your breath, your pulse to the motor's whirling throb until space and time dissolve and the vortex is you, tumbling into weightlessness, almost flying in that womb-like limbo.
one more poem about uh, local stuff. Almost spring on Stormville Road, which a road some of you may know. Released from weight of winter snow, last year's grasses lie in brown and flattened tangles, unready for surrender to incipient green in this scene of seasonal casualties. The carcass of a yearling deer decomposes in a thicket. Corpses of snowplow victims, mailboxes newly decapitated, sprawl beside parts from long-dead automobiles. An ancient tire fused fast to the wheel, a piece of tail tailpipe ominously coiled, rusty viper. Discarded carpet, frozen and thawed to filthy pulp in the grass's twisted grip, resists the grand green blast of not too distant reveille, the carnival to come. We're almost there. And then here's another one, I guess it could be any part of the country. Um, the creative squirrels trying to get the stuff out of the bird feeder. <clears throat> I call this one backyard physics. In a burst of aerial artistry, a fat-tailed squirrel seizes the rim of the bird feeder, hurls himself around in the air, body stretched taut as he turns in the gyre of his own momentum, centrifugal force dislodging the seed, now spewing furiously in all directions, mana milled in the whirlwind of his wheeling. I thought this guy was so smart. He gets a hold of his feeder and around and around and around. Seeds coming out like crazy. He's, okay, that's enough. Jumps down, starts gobbling it up. I can feel my voice is going, so I think I've probably uh, tried your patience long enough. But thank you again for coming out on a gloomy night. If anybody um, wants to ask any questions or start any conversations, we can do that for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm sure that's why I picked them, because they, you want to feel that hope right now. Oh, the one about the morning glories lasting so long, that always gives me hope, too. It's like we all feel we've had, we've lost time that we'll never get back. But, you know, maybe things will, will go on longer than we think. Not the pandemic. I mean, the good things that come afterwards. Ah, yeah. I, one of the things that struck me about this time of staying at home and enforced isolation is that it should be a writer's dream. And I told myself that's how I should look at it. And no distractions, no place to go, nothing to take you away. So all those projects you've made notes for and that are backed up, it, you should be appreciating this. But it's so hard to do that. But then I think of all the famous writers who paid their agents to lock them in hotel rooms <laughs> so they would be isolated and have quiet and couldn't go anywhere and wouldn't be distracted. And here it's like a gift. <laughs> uh, but it's very difficult to avoid what I call the zombie effect, this sort of zombie-like inertia sort of takes over. And you just don't, it's a real enervation kind of thing. And you, you have all these plans how you could be productive with this time. And sometimes it's very difficult to get yourself going to take the first step to do those things. But when I do take a first step and get something done, I do feel better. So there is that. Um, but very, very difficult to make yourself go. But as you say, there's hope now of spring and a summer that we maybe will be able to enjoy more than last year. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks again. Thank